We're continuing on in our series on First and Second Peter, and we've arrived at the first chapter of Second Peter. We're going to read verses three through eleven. If you care to follow along in your Bible, listen to the Word of God. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He's given us a very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of heaven of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God's blessing be on the reading of his word. Well, as many of you know, our daughter married a man from southern India, and so... Laura and I, we got on a plane for close to 24 hours <laughs> and flew to India for this Indian wedding at my son-in-law's church in Cochin. It's right above Goa Beach. And um, it's a different kind of place. There's a lot of people. Uh, we figured in the same square miles uh, from um, maybe from Milton on up to Bethany in this town, there's about 2.1 million people. You can never say you're alone in his town. There's always somebody nearby. But one of the peculiar things we noticed as we were riding around town in these little three-wheeled motorcycle, dangerous kind of vehicles, was um, a lot of half-built buildings. You saw commercial buildings where the foundation had been laid. The block had been laid up two stories, and they had the, the initial part of the roof on. And then the whole thing had stopped. And you knew it had stopped for quite a while because there's moss growing on the outside of the building and there's vines all over the building. It's as if, you know, they they got got this building project going, got everything, the, the bones of the building all structured up, and then they just decided to stop. And some of these building projects were stopped for 10 or 20 years. So I asked a local, I said, what gives with these buildings that have been built like they could almost be occupied, but there's no windows, doors, or electricity or anything else? I said, what? why don't they just finish them? And they said, you don't understand. India goes at a different pace. I said, clearly. <laughs> clearly it does. And I guess they, they get enough money to do the first part, and then they, they wait a long time to get the rest of the money to finish the building. And uh, lest we pick on India, I've seen a few houses around here where people started a house and it's kind of gone sort of slowly. <laughs> That's lower, slower Delaware, I think. In the New Testament, our life in Christ is compared to building a house or a spiritual building, if you will. You remember some of Jesus' parables, the parable of the wise and foolish building. The wise man built his house on the rock. And the foolish man built his house yeah, on Lewis Beach or Rehoboth Beach. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't have hurricanes, so I guess it's okay. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18, St. Paul compares building the Christian life to building a spiritual structure. The foundation is Christ. And he says some build with precious metal, gold and silver, um, precious stones. Others build with wood, hay, and stubble. And at the end of the age, the master 
inspector, Jesus Christ, will judge each person's work. Finally, in Luke 14, 28 through 30, Jesus says to count the cost before you build. Do you remember that? He says if a a person wants to build a building, shouldn't you make sure you have enough money that you can finish it? Otherwise, you'll build up this building and it'll be half built and people will walk by and laugh at you and say, look at that. This guy thought he was going to build something and there it is, half finished. It's a shameful thing. Make sure that you've decided that you'll finish what you've started and not quit in the middle of being a follower of Jesus. Count the cost. So many people hear the gospel and receive it with joy. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for their sins, was resurrected. They join the church. They're baptized. They're, they're, maybe they join the choir. They're in Sunday school, and they're, they're going great guns. And then for one reason or another, everything comes to a halt. They walk with Jesus, and then it just becomes stagnant. Nothing's happening anymore. It's like one of those buildings in India where those, you know, the, the foundation goes in, the building goes up with a flourish, and then all of a sudden they just decide to stop. And I think that happens with Christians. They stop growing in Christ, and the kingdom of heaven becomes a smaller and smaller portion of their life to the point where it's one hour on Sunday morning and that's it. Some drop away from the church completely. I can't tell you, I've mentioned this before, but I run into many people who they retire from their work somewhere else and they come to Lewis or Rehoboth and they also retire from Jesus. Fascinating stuff. Some have a faith that's just on life support. It's just barely there. They're just eking it out. Just a little bit. We've got our hell insurance and that seems to be enough. Friends, the construction project of building our life in Christ. Do you know when it's complete? When your heart beats for the very last time. When you take your last breath. And your spirit leaves your body and stands before the Lord. That's when you're done. That's when the project's over. But until that happens, until you're face to face with Jesus in eternity, you're not done. And the goal of the Christian life is to become more and more like Jesus day by day, week by week, year by year. And we don't stop in the middle of it. Our goal is spiritual maturity to become like Jesus. That's what the finish project looks like. Well, in our passage today, Peter talks about building our life in Christ. And he begins with the resources that God has given us. And then he goes through the stages of construction and building, a life committed to Jesus. First, what does it take to build a life committed to Christ and being his disciple? What resources has the Lord given us? The answer is, according to St. Peter, Everything. He's given you everything you need to build the project. Uh, God has given you everything. My first job after graduating from Virginia Tech, 1986 was a tough time to find a job. So my first job was 84 Lumber Associate Manager. Do you know about 84 Lumber? Answer the phone a thousand times. 84 Lumber, your number for lumber. What can I do for you? And um, Anyway, 84 Lumber, they had these deals where they, they would give you a complete shed package or garage package or even a small house. You could even buy, you know, the, the materials for a complete house. And let me put this carefully. Theoretically, when you received your materials, you shouldn't have to buy one more piece of material. Theoretically. All you needed was the tools the know-how and a lot of elbow grease in it, it should be a done deal. Now, I'll, I'll say it like I did back when I worked there. Concrete foundation, not included. <laughs> not included. 
with our life in Christ, God provides everything. And St. Peter said the most important thing he provides is the divine power of God. I'm going to go Greek on you for a minute. Is that okay? All right. The word in, for power in Greek is dunamai or dunamis. So where would we get the, the word dynamo? You know what a dynamo is? You know what dynamite is, right? That's the kind of power we're talking about. It's fantastic. It rearranges the world. It's supernatural. Capable of doing a lot of stuff. And because it's from God, it's supernatural. His power is what you need to build a godly life of following Him. The power is present in the person of the Holy Spirit. When you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit took up residence in your heart, started living inside you. And the Holy Spirit started changing you from the inside out, gave you spiritual abilities, changed your wants and your needs. So many people, they say, well, I'll join church, I'll become a Christian after, after I get my life together, when I stop drinking too much. When I stop, you know, fornicating or committing adultery, when I cut out the bad habits, then I'll join the church. Once I get things sorted out, I'm like, you'll never join then. You'll never be a Christian because you can't change yourself. Only God can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's also something else that God's given us that enables us to build the spiritual house, knowledge of himself. And his promises to you and I. Important promises like, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Promises like, I'll make sure that you make it to eternity to the end. I won't let you fall. I won't let your foot slip. These are the things we need to build this house. God wants us to build and what he wants us to accomplish These are found in his word, which is the Bible. The spirit provides the power and the abilities to build a life of discipleship. The Bible is the blueprint for how it's done. You ever see someone try to build a house without a blueprint? When I lived in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the Amish folks, they'd build without blueprints all the time. She had to check and make sure the walls were square because half the time they weren't. It'd be like that. I'm like, oh boy. And um, they just build it like they pictured it in their heads. And sometimes it worked out, sometimes not so much. God's word, the blueprint, shows us what the finished product is supposed to look like. In fact, he's the master builder. We're just the participants in what he's doing. Why is it that so many Christians could be characterized as a spiritual building where construction has come to a halt and not much has been done in years. The answer is God won't force you to participate in what he wants to do in your life. He, won't, he didn't turn you into a spiritual robot the moment you gave your life to Christ. He won't force you to go along with his plan for your life. That's up to you. You've got to decide, yes, Jesus, I'm going to go along with it, or no, I, I like the foundation and I like the outward structure, but hey, you know, I'm a simple guy. I don't really care if windows go in or there's a door or there's plumbing. I'm fine with it just like it is. Some people are like that. Let me say this first. Salvation and forgiveness of sin, like Life after death, it's a free gift. You can't earn it. But building a life in Christ, becoming a disciple like he wants us to be, takes effort on our part, cooperating with the Holy Spirit and following the blueprint that's found in Holy Scripture. Listen to 1 Peter. Tell me if this sounds like, like easy chair type building. 1 Peter 1.5. Make every effort to add these things to your life in Christ. Verse 10, make every effort to confirm your calling 
an election. Doesn't sound like sitting back in the easy chair, does it? You're a participant. I remember some of the mission projects. We'd go down to West Virginia before I came here, and we'd go. I was up on a roof putting a tin roof on top of a house with a 75-year-old lady who insisted on being up there with me. And we're dinging in these nails to put this tin roof. And because it's in West Virginia, you're on the side of a mountain. So if, if you tumble, you're not just going two stories down. You're going about 75 feet down the side of a mountain. And we were up there doing this tin roof, and it was hilarious. There's about 30 people in in uh, folding chairs with beverages watching us, and they're all under the age of 40. I'm like, something's wrong with this. <laughs> That's not the kind of participation God wants with us in building these spiritual buildings. I've helped several folks in building houses and buildings. I'm not an expert builder. And so I'd do whatever the carpenter tells me to. Hey, Greg, go get some more two-by-fours. Hey, Greg, I left, my, I left my measuring tape in the truck. Go get it. So go get it. Hey, hold this header up while I nail it in. Okay, I'll hold it up. I just do what, I, what I'm told, but I'm, I'm an active participant in what's being built. I'm cooperating. I'm helping the master builder as he's putting this life dedicated to Christ together. Philippians 2.12, Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying earn your salvation. He's saying you participate with me and what I want to do in your life. We have a part to play. In fact, Peter says, confirm or find your calling in the kingdom of heaven. Each one of us has a specific role. Each building's not going to be the same. We're not like one of these. Some, of, I guess there are some places in Lewis, it's like cookie cutter. They just built the same stinking house over and over again. And you, you've got to do your job to make it stand out. But builders like to do that because it's easy. But when God is working on each one, of, each one of us, each one of us is different. We're unique. We have a special purpose. He has a special thing in mind for each one of us. Each of us has a role. And he says, confirm your election. Let me say this. I've, over the years, 30 years of ministry, I've probably done five or 600 funerals. Don't leave people guessing as to whether or not you love Jesus. I've done funerals where I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder where they ended up. <laughs> They sure didn't live like a Christian. Hope they made it. But when you worship every Sunday and you have character that reflects Christianity and Christ, no one has to guess whether, knew you, whether or not you knew the Lord. Whenever you build a building, there's an order to construction. You know this. Now, those of you who are builders, you'll just have to excuse me. This isn't what I do for a living. You build the foundation first. You pour the footers. Then you lay the block, the thing that you're going to put the framing on top of. And then you can put outside covering on the framing. Then you put a roof on. And if you want electricity and plumbing, you probably ought to do that before you put the wall board up. It gets kind of hard if you don't. In the Christian life, the foundation is faith in Christ. It's, it's accepting Christ as Lord and Savior and agreeing to be his disciple. If you don't do that, you don't have anything. That's the start. On top of this faith is added goodness. New believers have to choose to do things God's way rather than the world's way. It's to re reject evil and to choose goodness. It's um, everyday decisions of life. A new Christian, you've got to decide you're going to be truthful rather than be a liar. You've got to decide you're going to be kind rather than cruel to the people around you. You decide, some people, they've got to decide to be sober rather than drunk. You're choosing goodness. 
And the Holy Spirit directs us in this. You know how that works, don't you? You ever engage in an activity where you're not real sure about it, and as you're getting into this activity, suddenly all the alarm bells start going off? You think, what am I doing here? Maybe this isn't a good idea. Psychology calls it your conscience, but I believe the Holy Spirit pricks your conscience. Makes you say, are you going to choose the good or are you going to choose evil? On top of goodness is knowledge, knowledge of God and his word. Disciples must be readers and students of the word. And we're never done with this. As a pastor, I've been studying God's word for well over 30 years, but I'm still learning new things about God and his word every day. And it's been much longer than 30 years, I've got to tell you. On top of knowledge is one of the hardest things. Self-control. Learning to keep my passions and my sinful desires in check. As a Christian, one of the hardest things I have to do is to keep my words under control. You remember what James said? You can burn your life down if you say the wrong thing at the wrong moment. Remember, he says, uh, he says, it's like a spark of fire. You can set the whole forest on fire with your mouth. You can destroy a marriage. You can wreck your employment. You can end a friendship. You say the wrong stuff. You don't check your words, man. You will wreck your life faster than you know what's happened to you. I need to check my thoughts. And people say, well, thoughts are thoughts. Who cares what you think? Aren't they your thoughts? I mean, you're not hurting anybody by thinking bad stuff. And the reason we're to have control of our thought life is because the stuff that we do usually percolated up here for quite a while. Before you tell someone off, you've been thinking of telling them off for weeks. It's true. You've been grinding that ax, and then finally you get the moment, and you let them have it with both barrels. Watch your thoughts. We're to be in check of food and drink and sexuality. Some of us have short fuses. You got to get that temper under control. On top of self-control, perseverance. Don't quit. Don't give up your life in Christ. When I began ministry back in the 90s, um, I'd say most of my class quit church ministry within the next, within the first five years. Got eaten alive. Church wasn't what they thought it was going to be. All kinds of surprises um, when you show up and um, and they quit. Got out of the trenches. Walked away. One uh, professor said, you know, if you want to stay in ministry, he said two things. Don't commit adultery and don't quit. How about that? You'll be fine. But the temptation is to quit. One of my best friends in his 20s had a rough time on a mission trip. Came back. He was sick. He'd been beaten up emotionally. And he says, you know, I'm convinced the Christian life can't be lived, so I'm not going to do it anymore. He quit. And... There's always the temptation just to check out and not do it anymore. Don't do it. Add, that's perseverance. Add to this godliness. Take on the character of Christ. Copy him in the way that you view and treat others. Grow closer to him. To godliness, add mutual affection. Love your fellow believers. Forgive and encourage. Walk alongside. Where do we practice these things first? Husband, wife kids. That's where you learn to, to love and put up with stuff, right? You know, that's where you learn to, you get lots of practice at forgiving and patience at home. That's how it's done. And then you go outside your home and your neighbors, your HOA, <laughs> your, uh, your church friends, the people you work with, right? And finally, love. Always love Love the Lord, love others, love fellow believers. Mutually love one another. 
I mean, it seems like a long list of to-dos, but some people, they think, well, I've arrived. I've done everything I need to do in Christianity. Well, if you've read that list, if you've done all these things and you've arrived, let me know. I want to find out how you did it afterwards. Come and talk to me. But God's got a program of building that he wants to work at, and we don't do it all at once. We look at our life and we say, I need to work on this. Okay, I think I've got this down. Now I need to work at this. And some things we work at our whole life, like, like knowledge and loving. And, and you got loving down with your husband and your wife and your kids. And here's one for me is love your siblings. Isn't that tough? Kids are easy. Wives are easy. Siblings, oh my golly, that, that takes work. My, my brother and sister are still upset about things I did to them when I was 12. Um, so we got to work at that. But we work at knowing his word and growing closer to him all through life. And then Peter says, if you do all these things, you'll be effective in living for Jesus and carrying out his mission in the world. You won't stumble. And when this life is done, the master builder, the inspector will welcome you with these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen and amen.